hello, welcome. Today we have a very interesting conversation with Paul, and I think it's actually quite special, I would say, uh, because I, I've been trying to bring diversity into these webinars, but it's the first time we have an entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial view, and I think with a, not only an entrepreneur, but a serial entrepreneur that has been uh, looking at different sides of the story, and also from a personal side, Patrick Reichardt, and who is a research fellow here at the center, used to work with Paul. So we also have kind of an, a, a personal connection uh, on that side. So it's, it's good to, to have you here. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. I know that this is kind of a, a different time than our usual webinars, but I hope, uh, I, I know we're going to have a very interesting uh, conversation today. Uh, on a topic that is actually uh, very current and, and very needed, I think after COVID, uh, we are also putting much more focus and understanding much more how uh, important it is to address systemic challenges, if you want, uh, and how this systemic risk that sometimes it seems they were far away and, and climate crisis and climate change and are, are bringing or are coming more into i would say the first slide especially if we, if we think about it in in the financial world how do we address how do we fi finance new solutions that can work at the systemic level and i think for me it was kind of a an interesting day all this whole week i've been coming to imd and i had some actually some face-to-face -face sessions on, on on an mba program but a couple of days I came by car and there was a moment I said, okay, no, I'm going to come all day. I need to go back to my normal routine of coming by train, you no, know, with mask and social distancing, but taking the train. Uh, so at the time I also started thinking uh, about me, my, my cardboard footprint impact, if you want. And from the morning coffee machine that I use to the train and to the avoidable things uh, that I can do. And I think the same process, obviously not at a personal level, but I get to deal with a lot of companies that are putting now at the forefront, if you want, at a much larger scale, what is the carbon footprint of their operations. You no, know, And really the choices that we make uh, affect the size of our carbon footprint, affect uh, the imprint that we're going to have on the environment. And we are seeing a lot of companies actually committing to uh, very specific targets and even carbon neutrality and even carbon positive if you want and really there's over 260 corporations even in, in the US that are committing to 100% renewable energy so how are we going to achieve that is it a matter of reducing are we talking about compensating are we talking about changing completely our, our business models can a corporate do it on its own uh, can an entrepreneur bring in a solution scale fast enough to really provide these kinds of solutions to market? So some of the things are we are going to try to to talk today with Paul uh, in a very specific context, uh, but I think it will apply. And I, I please welcome uh, a lot of your your questions to make this conversation very lively and uh, to also bring it to to your own experiences. No, and I think. A lot of things that we've seen here too uh, in previous webinars was the concept of additionality. You know? And so and I think that's an interesting part that we're going to talk today because we're not going to talk only about climate crisis or, or dealing with, cli with climate, but also we're going to talk about the affordability of clean energy. You know? So how many projects that might not be viable or that cannot, and especially if you get to last mile distribution or to off-grid areas, how can we really make them viable? And how can private capital and other partnerships and collaboration can actually de-risk these, these projects and can work together to bring the solutions in a win-win way? Now, so we are not only going to talk about climate action, if you want SDG 13, we're also going to talk about affordability of clean energy, SDG 7. Now, so, and with a very special focus on innovation, on innovation from the entrepreneurial side, on, on how we finance the solutions and how we re get these solutions to reach uh, our targets, uh, but also from the financial side, how we can bring, bring new collaborations to market 
that respond to these challenges. So a little bit as usual of our typical Q and A and 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 house logistics. No, uh, remember that at the bottom we have the Q and A. Uh, so the questions, please don't do questions in the chat. Use the Q and A icon on the bottom. And if somebody else asks a question that you really like, you can click on the like and that question will pop up and I will see it higher. We also have Patrick Reichardt here that he will be helping me with a Q&A and if there are some quick questions that he can answer, he will get right back to you and some I will answer. I will try to answer as usual, as many as I can uh, live. Uh, so you get to talk a little bit too uh, with Paul uh, along with me. And, and so without much more introduction, let me say, Paul, thank you to you. Thanks for being here. Paul is the founder of Positive Capital Partners currently, but he's, as I mentioned, a serial entrepreneur. And he has more than 20 years of experience in the fintech and cleantech uh, area. And he has experience as a CEO, but also as a bond board member in many leading companies. And I think something that I like a lot about Paul is that he experienced the full process of the full life cycle, you know, from the inception of a concept and maybe even the naive part of an entrepreneur to the successful exit. He actually had with Simpa Network a successful exit in November 2018 when Simpa was acquired by Engie in, in India. And he currently co-chairs a task force for distributive renewable energy certification. That is something we are going to talk today about what this certification means and why can this be an innovation in, in the sector. So uh, since again, you have the burden or the weight in your back, if you want, of being our first, uh, if we put a label, social entrepreneur, uh, what we're very proud of, of, of that label here, <laughs> when it's a social innovation center, you know, so of having created a business around the social and environmental problem, you know, so you founded Simpa Networks in 2010, and you actually were patented even, you're the one that patented the pay-as-you-go uh, system for solar companies, you know, so how this idea started 10 years ago when we didn't envision the growth that actually the sector and the maturity that the sector has now and why you started in India. Now, what was the business case at the time, if you want to walk us through and what was the need uh, where you started or created this company? And thank you for being here with us. And thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to see you again and nice to be part of this conversation. Um, so yes, I co-founded Simpa Networks with two other co-founders. And I think really each of us had our own um, uh, eureka moment that, uh, that led us to the business idea and led us to India. Um, I've always had, uh, since my undergrad days, I've always had a real interest in India. I had a fantastic university professor uh, in development economics that uh, turned me on to the challenges of uh, economic development and and the exciting opportunities in India. Um, but it, for me, it was in Tanzania when I was visiting as, uh, as a board member of a not-for-profit organization uh, that works on girls' education. I uh, attended a meeting with a number of young women entrepreneurs that had received microloans uh, from this organization to grow their businesses. And uh, they were doing subsistence farming, mostly, um, raising chickens, growing potatoes, um, uh, 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 growing tomatoes, and they'd received microloans to expand their business. And I was very interested to ask and learn whether these loans had, had substantially improved their incomes. And I was somewhat disappointed to hear that although they were able to get more land or more chickens and more tomatoes, it was still quite a struggle. Um, one woman was growing tomatoes and I asked her if it had been a good year now that she had maybe two acres instead of one acre of land. And she said, well, this year was good. We had a lot of tomatoes, but everyone else had a lot of tomatoes too. All of the other tomato farmers in the area because the, the weather was great this year and they many of the tomatoes rotted on the side of the road and the truck drivers came in from the cities and negotiated the prices down so even in good years it's still very very difficult to make a living 
uh, in, in that sort of uh, farming because you're not, for many reasons, but one of which is there's this intermediary that sits between you and your customer. And uh, so I asked her uh, more hopefully, well, what would you do if you were to get another micro loan? She said, well, I think I'd buy a solar panel because there's, a, there's another woman in another nearby village that has this great solar panel and she's charging people's cell phones. And she has a, a lineup of people outside her shop that are there to charge cell phones. This is in 2009. And um, it struck me that one entrepreneur had uh, two acres of land and the other one had about one square meter of solar panel. And both of them were attempting to convert sunlight into something useful, uh, sunlight into, <laughs> into a flow of electrons or sunlight into some beautiful tomatoes. Um, and one of them was clearly a better business with just a square meter of sunshine. She was able to generate value locally uh, for her local customers. There's no intermediary and the sunlight was, was hers to capture. Um, so better technology. We've been doing agriculture for 10,000 years. I'm not sure how long we've been doing tomatoes, but um, the technology there has not substantially improved over the past 10,000 years. Uh, so we have a better way to convert sunlight into something valuable. And, and it was that um, moment for me where I thought, okay, the problem with all renewable energy technologies, the challenge is the big upfront cost. So how could we somehow finance panels uh, or solar equipment for low income people in rural areas? The first idea was to offer it to entrepreneurs like that so they could run a business based on the, the value they can create. But uh, when we went to India, the, the, the reason for India was because of the massive market opportunity. At the time, there were uh, 400 million people without access to electricity. I'm from Canada. There's more than 10 times the population of Canada with no electricity, many more with extremely unreliable electricity in rural India. And we had some great um, connections there, opportunities to partner with a particular company, uh, which, which aided us tremendously to get out and, and test the model. And of course, the big idea was to offer solar as a service and not as a product which means we integrated IoT technology into the solar product, ultimately into the panel itself, into the back of the panel, which allowed us to remotely control that solar panel and monitor its performance. And therefore, we could offer it on a pay-as-you-go basis, much like a prepaid mobile phone. So the customer would make a small payment up front. We would go ahead and install the equipment. They would get a solar panel, battery, uh, lights, a fan, maybe a TV, there's different packages available. But none of it would work until the customer prepays for energy service, maybe five days at a time, one month at a time, whatever the customer can afford. So, and, and when they run out of credits, they start to get SMS alerts on their phone. And when the balance is at zero, the system turns off and they, go, they naturally go over to a nearby agent in the village and top up the system. And when they pay that agent money, the agent runs the transaction on their mobile phone and the system magically turns on again and is available for the prepaid number of days. And how was it to get funding for, for this type of idea? Did you get funding from commercial VCs? Did you get funding for impact investors? Uh, what was kind of the pitching that you were doing? What were they interested in? In. Yeah. Well, initially, we got a very small grant, which helped us build a prototype of this pay-as-you-go technology, the hardware and the software. And with the, the prototype, a PowerPoint, and a little bit of customer testing, but not enough, we were able to then raise our first seed round for, um, for about a million dollars from impact investors. So all of the investors, at, well, most of the investors at that point were um, I would say angel impact investors. Uh, there was one foundation that came in. It was all equity. Um, now, as we, every investor asked us, um, as you scale, who's going to invest in the second round? And at the time in 2010, it wasn't clear who would be available to invest because there weren't a lot of impact investors, institutional impact investors at the time. Um, so it was a big leap of faith 
from these investors to not only put money into a business that is serving a, a rural, uh, low-income customer segment, um, but also just purely from an investor's perspective, you always want to know who, you know, as the business scales, if it's successful, it will need more capital. And where's that coming from? And at that time, it was really quite unclear. Yeah, and I think it's very interesting that maybe that part of the value proposition that would made attract this idea of affordability that, that we are talking about came from these pay-as-you-go systems to this ability to, to make it work as a service uh, rather than, than, than a product, as you were saying. But also mm. imagine that the impact side of the story, and I know you've been quite successful on the impact side. And so if you can tell us, if we jumpstart even at, at, at the end of the story, a little bit the, mm -hmm. the outcomes of, of this process and the kind of impact that it was achieved uh, with Simpa Networks, if you want, and, uh, before you exited and before NG. Uh, made yeah. the, this additional part of, uh, of buying, if you want, Simpa Networks, no? And why? Yeah. Why? What did they see in the ten years after that were actually willing to mm. to, to make a bet on on this technology? No? Okay. Do you have that and the slide? network? Not only. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Do, you have, do you have the slide with all the photos? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's nice. I love that slide, and we have. Uh, in our offices, we had um, collages like this. We we tried to get photographs of our first um, was it our first ten thousand customers, and I think we we built this wonderful, beautiful big collage uh, that was then uh, put on all of our office walls. I think it that one actually had just a thousand customers in the photograph. But um, anyways, the. When I left, we had about 850 employees full-time um, and another 2,000 uh, sales agents. So these are people who are earning commissions from the sale of the top-up uh, or basically customer referrals as well. Um, we were on 50,000 rooftops across three states of um, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Orissa, many districts, um, 26 branch offices. Um, and uh, yeah, just, you know, fantastic impact, both in the job creation, uh, training most of those employees. We recruited from, from the areas where we work, the, the rural areas, uh, trained them to be solar technicians or to work in sales and marketing. Um, about 100 people at head office in Delhi or Noida, um, working in call center and, and, of course, marketing and finance. We were able to build partnerships with domestic banks that would then offer these loans to our customers. Uh, they would you know, underwrite these pay-as-you-go contracts, uh, thus helping our customers get access to finance and access into the, the formal financial uh, services sector uh, uh, for the first time. So yeah, fantastic impact. The business was scaling. We, we needed more capital to scale. And we had already raised um, about 26 million in equity and debt from a range of investors, both impact investors and some that were more commercially minded. Also debt from the Asian Development Bank, um, from OPIC, the US uh, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, some long-term loans there to underwrite, uh, or to, to finance the equipment that we would uh, uh, lend on to our customers. Um, NG bought the company um, and has continued to invest uh, to grow it. Now, of course, with the, the present situation with the pandemic, it's been extremely difficult on all businesses. Um, I, I stay very close to the sector, and I know many companies that are offering last mile essential services in energy or in, in other categories are really struggling right now. And I know that there are a number of efforts to help um, uh, help companies. You know, a decade, this, in this industry has been going for a decade. This industry of providing access to energy um, on a commercial basis has been going for about a decade. And uh, so much great work has been done. So many companies have been built, but many of them are struggling right now because of the, the difficulty of uh, uh, the pandemic. So that gives me a good introduction because we also know that the pandemic has caused a, 
a, a, a put a lot of, uh, if you want a lot of press, pressure also on smallholder farmers, poverty is increasing. And we are seeing a lot of a lot of different uh, problems also arising. And we know that we, you left Simpa Network and you have a new venture and you actually changed sides. So you, you, you went to the, I always say the dark side of the financial world and you're looking now at the challenge to mobilizing private capital in a different way. So mm -hmm. what is happening, what do you think is happening now on the financial side in this intersection uh, between climate finance and energy actions. What are the new challenges that you are seeing now that you left Simpa Networks and you created uh, uh, this new venture? Uh, what are what are the challenges you are facing now? Well, so first of all, one of the challenges in the off-grid energy space or the challenges around SDG 7, Sustainable Energy for All, is really the mobilization of finance into the sector. Um, uh, exchange rate risk is a, is a major concern for investors that are investing into long-term, into projects that generate long-term returns, uh, such as renewable energy projects. So that's been a big barrier across the renewable sector in emerging markets. Um, uh, and if you're, if you're providing last mile services, as Simpa is, was, where the mission is to make clean energy simple and affordable and accessible to everyone, um, you're dealing with low income customers whose incomes are variable and unpredictable. And in, in that context, the margins are slim and somewhat unpredictable. They can, you can have good years, good months, bad months. And all those factors make it very difficult for investors to get excited about the sector. Um, and that, so that's been a chronic challenge. There, there's, you know, there, there are commer many of the businesses are commercially viable. They're just not really sexy investments right now for mainstream investors. So I've been looking at, we've been looking at that problem and how we might um, drive investment from new corners of the economy. Um, and, you know, there's some really exciting things happening, as, as you'll see on this slide. You know, one very positive trend is this um, upswell of investor <clears throat> support for and demand for climate action. So we're getting pressure, not we, I mean the, the economy, I mean businesses are, are getting pressure from major institutional investors that are, um, and, and as you see here, for example, Climate Action 100, a coalition of over 500 global investors with $42 trillion under management are demanding from companies, uh, climate action plans. They want their, the corporates they invest in to align their business plans with, uh, with the Paris targets. The Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change, a European group, are doing much the same thing, but also with a focus on the need for policy changes. So they're, they're pressuring government to introduce the policies that can help shift our economies to, to low carbon. So there's um, this, this is a, a very positive trend and we're now seeing climate leadership coming from some of the, the most cash rich companies the world has ever seen. Um, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, all have announced very large um, uh, and ambitious goals, not just to be carbon neutral, not merely to be carbon negative. Uh, they're putting their money where their mouths are, setting up very large funds uh, to invest in climate solutions. My personal favorite is, uh, is Microsoft, which is, um, uh, aims to be carbon negative by 2030 and by 2050 actually eliminate from the atmosphere all the carbon they've ever put in Supported. from the day they were founded on April 4th, 1975. Uh, the punchline there is that, uh, a few weeks later, Google announced kind of with a shrug that actually they looked at the math and they've already done that. Uh, they've, they're already there. So it's, um, you know, they're competing against each other uh, for climate leadership, which is really exciting. Um, one way in which corporates are taking direct action is in the procurement of renewable energy. Um, a, a movement started by the Climate Group and CDP is a group called RE100 or Renewable Energy 100. It's really a pledging platform where corporates, now 260 corporations, most multinationals, have made public commitments to power their global businesses 
with 100% renewable energy. Um, and they, they each set their own targets. It could be this year, it could be 10 years from now, but what's important is they go public about it. And uh, that means they, they then hold themselves accountable to that and the market can hold them accountable to that goal too. Um, it is a massive source of demand for renewable energy. And many companies start, by, start with energy efficiency. Then they start with rooftop solar, if they've got the roof space to do it, like a Walmart or an Ikea, they've got a lot of roof space. But if you're a bank, you're in office towers that you might be leasing, you don't have a lot of roof space. So um, what most companies then do is get into power purchase agreements or, or simply uh, they purchase the environmental attributes from a, a renewable energy project, often and ideally before the project is built. So there's a contract between a project developer that wants to build a renewable energy project and a corporation that wants to purchase renewable energy, often to offset the dirty electricity that they have to take because where they're, you know, wherever their businesses are, are situated or their buildings and facilities are situated and whatever grid they happen to be connected to, they have to take that electricity. But they want to ensure that whatever dirty electricity they're taking from the grid is replaced by clean energy. Uh, ideally at the same time of day, uh, if possible. So they enter either power purchase agreements before projects are built, committing in advance to purchase the electricity from a, a wind farm or a solar farm, um, or they enter agreements to purchase the, just the environmental attributes from a project, which then improves the economics of the project and, and makes it bankable. And that helps the project developer get financing and build uh, the, the project that otherwise couldn't get built. So that commitment in advance from these corporates to purchase the environmental attributes or to purchase the power uh, helps projects get developed that otherwise wouldn't get developed. And that's a, that is a, a source of capital into the renewable energy sector that has just been massive and growing. 43% um, year-over-year growth from 2018 to 2019, continuing and even accelerating. We'll see what 2020 is, um, uh, given our, our current situation. Um, but there's just a, a, a last year, 2019, 19, 19 gigawatts of new power was commissioned purely uh, from RE100 companies and from a corporate, voluntary corporate commitments to uh, renewable energy. So I know, let me ask you a question, and we have a question on the, on the Q&A, but I, I know up to now you talk about why there is corporate interest in transforming themselves, in the reducing, but also in offsetting the emissions they already have. You can say there is pressure, but there is also maybe hopefully leadership and will to do mm. this transformation to tackle climate crisis or climate change. But we're leaving a little piece of the story that is the affordability, the access side, that I know is very dear to your heart, heart, to your heart. and it's also the, the side of, of Simpa Network. No, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, in a sort of way, when, when we talked, you said, before I created a solution to kind of policing, uh, uh, if you want people off greed in order for pay, even though they got it, made it affordable, but those who paid were those in the, in the base of the pyramid or those that were off greed. Now you are shifting size and you're thinking, okay, if there is this interest with corporate, how can we put a new way of financing? And we have Christina Simonetti asking a question. Uh, and I know you're going to talk a little bit later, but I think it's a good way to introduce also affordability into the picture at, at this point. You no. Know? And she's asking, uh, as the global plan of action at Uni UNITAR Geneva, uh, we support the deployment uh, of our EU in, in humanitarian displacing settings. Given that the very difficult environment which financial mechanisms, which financial mechani mechanisms would you suggest to look more closely into recommended UN organizations for their operations for run, running our refugee camps? So if you want to get really to this off-grid or even more um, areas of, of with you have humanitarian crisis and refugee camps and you need to think about affordability and access what Absolutely. do you see coming absolutely oh i'm so glad you asked that question uh, <laughs> but we have we, um hold that thought for a moment we'll come back to that um because it, it's so very connected to to the project that we're working on now 
Um, Vanina, you're right. The, you know, at Simpa, we developed this really cool technology with IoT integrated into the back of the solar panel, allowing us to remotely monitor the panel uh, and, the, and the performance, but also to turn it off when it was time for the customer to pay. And that has, you know, I always, that always sat a little uncomfortably with me. It was very difficult, of course, to turn off someone's power, more difficult when we had to actually repossess systems. But those processes that we had to have in place to offer finance to our customers, of course, allowed us to scale, allowed us to offer finance to people that otherwise the banks wouldn't touch. And indeed, you know, 250,000 people or 50,000 customers um, have access to electricity today that, that wouldn't have had it. And, and many more because I left the company a few years ago. I, I, I don't know the latest numbers there, but it's certainly been growing. But it, that did sit uncomfortably with me, this, and, and I, but more from a perspective, I, I've been thinking, what else could we do with that technology? How could that metering, that remote monitoring technology be used to create value for someone else? Is there some way that data might be valuable or useful to others? Um, so over the past year with this new task force for uh, distributed renewable energy certification we've been engaging a lot with corporates i've been very interested in the re100 companies understanding the motivations understanding the, the strategies that they're using to procure procure renewable energy and what i found very interesting is that of, of that 19 gigawatts 80 to 90% of it is in developed countries in the US and in Europe. Even though these are global businesses with global footprints and supply chains that reach into emerging markets and indeed offering their services to, to consumers and, and businesses in emerging markets, they're not actively procuring or investing in renewable energy projects in emerging markets at any scale at all. And when we ask why that is, the, the, the answer is often, well, there's no good way for us to invest in renewables in emerging markets. There's no system in place to track how much energy is being generated. There's no third party system of tracking in place. In the US and in Europe, there, there are standards organizations that have set out protocols for how you measure uh, and, and, and trust the data on how much energy that wind project has generated today or has generated in the last five minutes. So this, there are standards organizations like the Gold Standard, like uh, Rex International, uh, Vera. And then there, there's a whole system and, and set of protocols involved. So when Microsoft says publicly, our business is powered by 100% renewable, you can look into the data. You can see that there's a system of third-party auditing. You can see that these uh, the renewable energy attributes have been packaged as a renewable energy certificate, as a REC, an REC. And one REC represents one megawatt hour of clean energy that's been delivered and third party certified. And that system of third party verification doesn't exist in most emerging markets. And that's what we're focused on with this project. We're focused on creating a new market instrument called a DREC, oh, there's the slide, thank you, called a DREC, a Distributed Renewable Energy Certificate that represents one megawatt hour of clean energy uh, generated from a distributed renewable energy uh, context. And this is a global standard that will work in emerging markets as well as it will work in Northern Canada in indigenous communities as well as it could work on a rooftop uh, in Colorado. Uh, so it's a, it's a new market instrument. We, we don't aim to um, create a new standards organization. Instead, we're partnering with existing standards organizations to help them extend their standard to contemplate and include distributed renewable energy. One question. We have a question from He Yun Lee. Uh, and he's actually a person I know well, so I'm uh, happy he's participating today. Uh, with this time, it, it helped his on the in that side. He's asking, uh, what happens? The margins are already relatively slim uh, on re renewable energy and in general, no. And what happens if you get China 
producing massively and more than 70%, for example, solar modules, how will this affect the cost structure? Will this be a better thing from this perspective? Because the, the solution you are finding now is more about how you track the, 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 the outcomes, no? so that you can show that it is really, or this will make it even more slim margins and private investors would not be interested. Mm, yeah, great question. In fact, in distributed renewable energy, the balance of system costs are a, a, a bigger part of the cost than the panel itself. Uh, and if you're working in rural areas, it's the cost of distribution, the cost of customer acquisition, the cost of service uh, and financing that bundled together represent the lion's share of the cost. So um, the dropping costs of solar panels and battery technology is hugely important. Um, but you've still got this upfront cost that needs to be financed. And of course, those costs will, will never go to zero. Um, we are obviously not in the business of, of manufacturing a panel, so we're not competing, we're benefiting. Uh, I mean, the industry I, I'm speaking on behalf of, the off-grid energy industry is, is benefiting from these uh, cost reductions um, only. Now, if you're developing a, uh, a wind project in the US, let's say, you can monetize the electrons that you're selling into the grid, but you can also monetize the environmental attributes. The fact that it's clean energy that you're generating means you can be awarded a REC, a renewable energy certificate, for every megawatt hour of energy, uh, clean energy that you deliver into the grid, and you can sell that. And corporates are buying those RECs. The best kind of contract is when the corporate it agrees in advance to purchase those RECs from you, and that helps you get the project financed in the first place. But again, that mechanism uh, that additional revenue stream is not currently available to off-grid energy companies. So they're leaving money on the table because there hasn't been this system in place to quantify and codify the renewable energy attributes that are coming from the great work that those companies are doing. So sometimes when you talk about uh, financial instruments and regs and certificates, this can become a little esoteric. And going back to Christina's, mm -hmm. a little bit to Christina's yeah. question, uh, and I know you have an example, but uh, if you had a humanitarian organization that wants to put or run a pilot on the field and quantify these kind of things to be able to monetize maybe the positive impact that they're not going to have only on energy, but also with refugees, if you want all the social out outcomes around that, uh, uh, how would you do that? What would be of interest if you can give us some examples of how you're piloting this idea? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, so I will say that the task force is really, a, for the task force for distributed renewable energy certification is a multi-stakeholder group involving some major corporations, uh, some standards organizations, many companies in the off-grid energy sector. Um, IFC is uh, supporting this, uh, UNDP is supporting it, um, the Shell Foundation is supporting it with grant funds as well. Um, and the, the purpose of the task force is to create this new market instrument and to demonstrate it with a pilot project. So we've identified a very interesting um, opportunity to pilot now in, in partnership with UNDP. So UNDP has a program of electrification for health clinics, particularly important right now. And together with UNDP, we've identified over a thousand health facilities, hospitals, rural health clinics, uh, COVID isolation centers in three countries, in Zimbabwe, Uganda, and Eswatini. UNDP has already arranged the donor funds to finance the upfront cost of the solar equipment to electrify these hospitals. And indeed, the work is already, has already begun and uh, those health facilities are being electrified. What has not yet been arranged is the, the, the financing to provide for the ongoing maintenance and operations and maintenance of these uh, systems. Now, solar energy systems do not require a lot of maintenance, but they do require some essential maintenance. And if the maintenance isn't done, the systems are gonna break. So the project is not sustainable unless we finance the ongoing operations and maintenance. 
And, you know, really we're looking at a 10 or maybe 20 year lifespan for some of these systems. So in order to deliver essential energy and to make these projects successful, we need to source an ongoing source of revenue. And that's where the DREC instrument comes in and that's where we're piloting it. So the idea here is that corporates will pay for the environmental attributes and corporates are committing to pay in advance. So they're making upfront commitments to purchase the environmental attributes that come from these projects. And in doing so, their funds are contributing to the ongoing operations and maintenance of the projects. And this allows for the, the financial sustainability of the projects. It also allows corporates to achieve their sustainability targets and to achieve their renewable energy procurement targets. Um, many of these companies have footprints in these countries. They are drawing energy from energy scarce economies. And this is a way for the companies to give back and to make sure that they are generating more energy for these countries than they're taking away. And they're making sure that that energy is being delivered where it matters most, where it can have a, a tremendous impact. So that's one model where don donor funds are combined with uh, corporate purchases of renewable energy attributes. And so it's a blended finance mechanism, um, a new kind uh, that, that has not really been possible before because it has been impossible to uh, do this remote monitoring uh, and to, of course, have uh, third-party verification of the energy that's actually being delivered. Right. And if you've been participating of any of the audience here have been participating, you know uh, my interest, our interest with Patrick and the Lea Center on Blended Finance Solutions too, because we, we truly believe that, that the collaboration that can come around these new financial instruments is, is kind of a new way of stakeholder collaboration. And that it also tackles at, at the systemic level. No? Mm. Um, so uh, we see a, a little bit the value proposition when you talk to, to corporates, what's in it for them if you had to summarize? Why? Because we are seeing now a huge sums if you want for green bonds and they're mm -hmm. emitting uh, through balance sheet debt etc and and we see also a lot of greenwashing in that area i know there is a green bond and then when you look at what is how it's used probably <laughs> it's not as green as we expected it's grayer you know in many mm -hmm. cases but we are seeing a lot of popularity and we're seeing regulation uh, eu taxonomy uh, to try to control and to try to measure the impact and we are seeing also with the if you want with a rescue package of the US, there is a say that almost 30% right. will go to green projects. So we do see a push and an interest from corporates, uh, but sometimes they're a little put by or put off of, of blended solutions because of the transaction cost, the collaboration. So what is in it for them? How uh, is the solution something interesting? And, and we do yeah. have many corporates that, that come to this, uh, to these webinars or read or, or look at this, this afterwards no yeah yes yes well again um corporates are are really leading uh you know 260 companies that have already committed under the re100 program um uh, there's true leadership there there's also leadership and pressure from uh investors that are are looking to companies to align their business plans with the paris targets uh, companies are under pressure as well from uh, their employees. There is just a huge upswell of demand from especially high-tech employees, uh, employees in high-tech companies that, that, are, you know, that, that want to work for responsible uh, companies. So uh, corporations have absolutely set aside budgets to achieve these uh, sustainability targets and renewable energy procurement is one big category there. Um, this particular pilot involves corporates being out of pocket to pay for the environmental attributes. And they're getting enormous social impact for that. And they're able to ensure that as much new energy is being generated as their business is, uh, is consuming. So that's truly valuable for the companies. But the DREC instrument can also be leveraged to create investable opportunities for companies. Um, for example, there are many funds that already exist that invest in distributed renewable energy projects. Some of those funds invested in our company in, in India. Uh, uh, Responsibility is a, 
a Zurich-based fund that is a, a very important investor in the off-grid energy space and, uh, uh, and other sectors too. Corporate, many of the, the, the leading corporates in RE100 are actually looking for investment opportunities. They're looking for ways to deploy capital, to earn a financial return, and earn the environmental attributes. So they're investing in wind projects, they're investing in solar projects. They're not just committing to purchase the power over time, or, and they're not just committing to purchase the environmental attributes, they're investing capital. And, and they're expecting a financial return, but they also are expecting the DREX, or the, uh, I should say, the environmental attributes, which could be REX or could be DREX. So um, uh, uh, an even more scalable model than what we're demonstrating with this power on health uh, pilot. An even more scalable model is a model where the corporates invest capital, uh, that, that capital gets deployed to build new rural mini grids, to build new community solar, to build new rooftop solar projects uh, in emerging markets. And those investments generate a financial return, but they also generate the environmental attributes for the investor. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that that distinction because I, we see that sometimes in the industry, and I think that has to be changed, but probably will come through to more conversations like this. Uh, corporates are more used to fund the sourcing rather than the distribution, you no, know, or mm -hmm. or to do the whole thing or the whole <laughs> uh, part of the story. Christina is asking another question, and I think I have a couple. If you're asking questions in the chat, please redirect it to the Q and A uh, because it's easier for me to follow. Uh, Christine is asking a follow-up question and saying, can you tell us your view of setting up an internal revolving fund or green fund and in international organizations or big humanitarian organizations to find their energy uh, workflow and energy projects? What, what do you think about? Mm, yeah, very interesting. Uh, many companies uh, are, are setting up sort of internal carbon pricing, um, you know, imposing a cost on the different units within the business and, and forcing uh, units and projects to account for the, the carbon cost. Um, but you're talking there more about uh, an internal fund, a revolving fund. Um, I, I think, you know, there are so many opportunities to deploy capital on an investment basis uh, earn a return and uh, achieve, you know, uh, or step towards your your sustainability targets. Um, I think it is important to have that discipline. Um, there, there isn't enough philanthropy to to solve the world's problems. Uh, philanthropy is absolutely essential, uh, and CSR activities are absolutely essential. But to really scale, uh, we need to find ways to shift investment capital towards uh, towards real solutions. So uh, internal funds, uh, I mean, obviously I'd love to know more about uh, how you're thinking about that, but um, I have seen uh, companies doing that quite successfully. Yeah, no, I, something we are also doing research and I think it's interesting is how can these blended finance solutions actually stop the duplication of a lot of different needs and the learning costs that you have when you establish a new fund and how you can build certain partnerships where there's a proven track record of, of collaborating and all, already bringing and really bring the, 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 the private capital at scale. You know, and sometimes the, the NGO or the United Nations organizations could be the part that works on the field or they provide the outcomes or have a different role that necessarily being the, the fund drivers, no. But but mm. I think it's interesting to see that a lot of humanitarian organizations are also thinking about innovative finance. And I, I am part of. If you again look at these webinars, we had one with a, with a Red Cross with ICRC. I have mm -hmm. a couple of other questions. Arnita is asking precisely on the certification side. So I think this is a key uh, part of the content that you're saying. No, she's actually saying, how would you think to create a certification or a rating body? For renewable energy generation that is accessible for customers in developing countries in terms of a fee, but still reliable for big companies uh, to to trust, you know the information. So, mm -hmm. how how can you? Because that's a key part of you. You need to have that that component of trust and, and access yeah. to to the certification. Yes. Well, the great question, and it links actually to an earlier point you made about uh, partnerships. Um, as an entrepreneur myself, 
when I first started uh, exploring this opportunity, my natural instinct was to think, okay, what kind of business can we create to solve this? But very quickly, after having a number of conversations with, uh, with corporates and then some of the standards organizations, I realized that the market transformation that needs to occur here is something that no one company can do, and certainly not a startup. Um, what, you know, trust is absolutely key, and you build trust through partnerships and through working together. Um, so we stopped looking at this as a for-profit uh, business opportunity and started looking at this as, as a public good. The creation of this new market standard is truly a public good. It can be utilized by so many different um, actors in the value chain, and we need to, um, in order for it to be successful, we need buy-in and support from many different corners. So that's why we structured this as a task force. Um, we're not structured as a new legal entity. Uh, we're structured as a, as a collection of parties that want to see this change in the world. Um, we started by involving the corporates. We brought in standards organizations. We brought in representatives from the off-grid energy space, technology providers, finance providers, IFC, for example, uh, and UNDP, who is bringing this fantastic pipeline of, of projects. Um, each of them is encouraged by the fact that the others are at the table. Um, the standards organizations would not pay attention to us if we were just a startup coming to them saying, hey, you know, the world needs this new market instrument, you should do it. Um, and we certainly didn't want to try to create a new standards organization. We want to work with the standards that the companies already trust and already uh, depend upon. Uh, so that was really important. Um, at, the, at that point, we happened to meet South Pole. South Pole uh, Carbon, uh, the, who, who's a, a really important uh, player in the carbon markets and environmental markets uh, based in Zurich, but with offices around the world, and, and a fantastic track record of helping companies achieve their sustainability targets uh, in environmental markets and renewable energy. So the task force is co-led by uh, our firm, Positive Capital Partners, and South Pole. And then above us, there is a secretariat it, where we have representation from some of the key funders of the project. Um, but the, the groundwork is being done by both Positive Capital Partners and South Pole, uh, contributing substantially to this ourselves, but um, also there's, there's a lot of support coming from all of the task force members. Uh, you could think of it as in-kind support, just a tremendous commitment of time and energy to help, uh, to help shape this. So you don't get scale doing it yourself. Uh, you need partnerships, you need trust, and, uh, you know, and, and for me as an entrepreneur, I'm coming from a world and a place in my career where I was very focused on building a particular business with a, you know, very narrow uh, focus to now looking at how can we make uh, market transformations and, uh, and how can we bring the partnerships together to do that. And I think we have an, an anonymous question uh, but it is part of maybe of the pushback that you can you can run on the field when executing this pilot, etc. But he he or she is asking. We have seen in the past pushback on localized grid coming from monopolistic power providers. Have you seen barriers being put up by local power providers exerting regulatory influence? If when the value exchange return on investment system start to scale. Hmm. Yeah. Great question. Um, I can't think of any direct examples. Um, the, in the case of mini grids where you're building a, a small power plant in a village and you are the sole provider of electricity in that village, there's a greater risk there that, um, that your customers could start to feel like they have no other options because there is a big upfront investment. To, to build that grid. And once one is built, it's, it's something of a barrier for another provider to come in and build a, a second grid and to compete for the same customers. That is true. There's, there's a monopoly situation that can be developed there. The impact investors that I've known and worked with would ensure that any company they're investing in is charging a fair price. 
and not uh, exploiting that uh, that monopolistic uh, position that the company uh, could find themselves in. So you've got to if and and frankly, any entrepreneur that I've met, any business that I've met that is that that cares about off grid energy and access to energy um, is not going. You know, they're not the kind of people that are going to be. Um, uh, taking advantage of that position. They're very much mission driven. Having said that, of course, you know, th that situation could arise and um, it's less of a problem with solar home systems because it's easier for competition to come in. Uh, and we certainly saw that, uh, we saw that a little bit with Simpa uh, in India, uh, in many of the African markets, there's much more competition, even within the same village, a uh, consumer could choose between two or three or four different uh, providers. We have another question, uh, and it's true that whenever we talk about maybe traceability of information and trust, blockchain pops up. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in, in the conversation, if you talk about value chain, if you are a fruit forestation, and and we have a, a value chain, here, you are blockchain a question here too. So. Uh, there are a number of projects and consortiums using right now uh, blockchain to create transparency and trust, as well as liquidity in the markets. Now, how you view this approach and advantages and risks? So have you thought about including a, a blockchain uh, component into the project? Yes, absolutely. I should have mentioned that uh, one of our one of the key partners in the task force is the Energy Web Foundation that has uh, come out of uh, Rocky Mountain Institute and has created um, uh, an open source blockchain platform uh, in with many features, but including the ability to track environmental attributes or RECs. Uh, they also have deep experience working with uh, RECs International for the IREC standard, which is fantastic. Um, so yes, it's, uh, it, and we were attracted to them and they were attracted to this project because uh, of the open source nature of what we're building here. Um, so, Yes, blockchain can absolutely add value here uh, and can reduce, and, and particularly the way the Energy Web Foundation um, chain is structured with a, a smaller number of, um, of nodes. Uh, there's, there's absolutely an opportunity there for, for cost savings and certainly improved um, uh, transparency. Um, the, the challenges, I would say, are more around how do you actually certify a particular installation? Um, and we're looking at ways of getting unique identifiers from, from meters, from uh, monitoring systems at mini grids and on uh, solar home systems. So you're able to track every kilowatt hour of energy that's been generated uh, and know exactly where and when that was generated. And then that data about the true origin of that energy uh, can indeed be uh, recorded in, in blockchain and then be available. So every token has its history as well. So time flies when you're having fun and it's, it's mm -hmm. almost here, 4.57. So we have three minutes, but we have a question from Martin that I think is perfect to finish up. And I also have an opinion on that one. So I'll, uh, I will add a little bit at the end. Uh, but he's asking, my view is that we need to establish the right ecosystem. Uh, so it's not about a company or a fund or a certificate. It's about a new ecosystem. This ecosystem that needs to get established to help, with the help of new technology to exchange environment attributes. What do you think? You know? Absolutely. I, I love the way you put that. It really is a new ecosystem. Um, when we started this, we were quite surprised to learn that there's this whole world and industry around renewable energy certificates and corporate procurement of renewable electricity. It's a massive industry, tens of billions of dollars a year uh, uh, moving through that. And then there's this off-grid energy industry uh, that is providing essential energy to low-income people in rural areas, doing rooftop solar mini grids, electrification of health clinics and more. And there's a set of funders around that, and there's a set of, uh, um, yes, investors, technology providers, et cetera. But these two worlds have not been talking to each other. And um, when we spoke to the corporates about, you know, and asked the question, well, why haven't you been investing in distributed renewable energy projects? One answer was, well, the scale is too small. 
um, we need to invest at least $10 million, $20 million at a time. We can't look at transactions smaller than that. And these off-grid energy projects are all too small. Someone needs to aggregate them. So that was one problem. Another problem is there's no system of third-party verification there. So even if we invest, how do we know how much energy has actually been generated? So yes, it's about creating a new ecosystem, connecting these two industries that are both thriving, but they've been speaking different languages. Um, and there have been these, these, these walls between them, these barriers that, uh, that this task force aims to break down. And uh, we're beginning to do that. And so thank you so much. And actually, this is part of the research we're doing with Patrick. And you, you, you took exactly even the words we're saying. We do believe that precisely a lot of blender finance solutions are looking at building the ecosystem and at systemic mm -hmm. change. Uh, but I think the advantage is, and I think you, we should not disregard this certificate side or this fund side. Why? Because it provides the grounding. As you said, sometimes when you talk about systemic change or we talk about ecosystem building, it can become too abstract or too large. And sometimes where we work around, and I think maybe I'm, maybe no, I am totally biased because I lead a center for social innovation. No, when we talk about building a specific solution, but at scale and at speed, because we need to act now. Mm -hmm. uh, this side of collaboration and changing the mindset because it requires corporates to think in a different way. It requires UN and NGOs to think and to talk to corporates in a different way, and even DFIs if you want, and development institutions in, in the de risking side or in the building trust. So, how we build and we change the mindset towards uh, this ecosystem building, I think uh, social innovation and blended finance as part of a social innovation, I would say. Uh, or provide a very nice platform to start the conversation and hopefully at the LEA Center that's what we do we convene people like Paul and like you all that are here um, to start the conversation and hopefully uh, also inspire new solutions so thank you very much uh, thank you and very much. thank you Paul for your generous time and inspiring um, new venture and count me in as a partner in crime and whatever we need from, from <laughs> my side uh, because I think it's always good to to to, to build a different partnerships. Also, include academia in, in a little bit in in this comprehensive or in these kinds of solutions. So, thank you, very, everybody, and I hope I see you on the next webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.